Welcome to our talk on producing. I'm Georgia. I'm a producing assistant with Connections at the National Theatre. I'm Emmy. I'm with Mousetrap. I've been with Mousetrap since 2014 and I've just graduated from Oxford with a degree in French literature. And if our lovely panel would like to introduce themselves, say your name and a little bit about who you are and what you do. Hello, um, I'm Amina Hamid and I run Amina Hamid Productions. I'm a creative producer mainly in the commercial sector um, and I've been doing it for four years now. Uh, my name is Rhys, I am the producer at New Diorama Theatre. We're a studio theatre in London, producing work with devised and ensemble theatres and I also independently produce through my own company, The Recreate Agency. Hello, uh, I am Sophie, um, pronouns she, her. Um, I'm the producer and general manager at Vault Festival um, and in independent producer uh, through my company, Metal Rabbit Productions. Um, and I don't, I really didn't say how many years he's been doing oh, no, it. I haven't. Um, <laughs> but I'll, I'll go ahead and maybe say that I'm the eldest. I've been doing this for about 10 years now. I've been doing it for five. I've been doing five. Five, there yeah, there we go. I'm the eldest here. That's good to know. Amazing. <laughs> Um, now Thank that you've you. heard a bit about our panellists, maybe try and think about some questions you might want to ask them at the end of this session. That's online on the Hoover app as well. So we'd like to start with the first question. So the first question, and probably quite a big question, is just in a sentence, what do you think a producer is? Sophie, can we start with you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, if I had a penny for every time I was asked this question, <laughs> um, then I'd probably be making a better salary than I do as a producer. Um, uh, so what is a producer? I think for me, the way that I always look to respond to this question really is um, separating out kind of what a general manager is and what a producer is. Um, and uh, as I sort of previously alluded to, um, I am both for my, for, you know, at Vault Festival. And that's because um, ultimately I think that people, the confusion really lies because of that confusion about the difference between general management um, and producing. Um, but a producer for me is somebody who is the ultimate advocate for a piece of work going on stage. You're the hustler. You are the person who is the most passionate and the, believing the most in it and therefore the person best capable of selling um, that piece of work and willing to take risk and believing in that piece of work. Now, how that practically um, kind of gets translated um, is uh, much debated and I think really depends on a personal um, your personal skill sets but ultimately you are the sort of figurehead and the champion um, of the, the piece of art um, more than anybody else I would say um, on a creative team so that's my definition of a producer um, and then the general manager is uh, for me somebody who kind of does a lot of the legwork that we'll probably end up talking about um, throughout the course of this. Reese? Yeah, no. I think for me, I can't take any credit for this. And as a producer, what I often do is pilfer other people's advice and regurgitate it. Um, but for me, I often think of myself as a realistic facilitator of other people's creativity. I can't remember who told me that, but whoever it was, it was very <laughs> useful. Yeah, and I think for me, a producer um, straddles all aspects of a production. You know, any, from, and on any one day, I can be involved in technical administrative, logistical, creative conversations, marketing conversations. And I think that we often talk about uh, theatre taking a sort of, it takes a village is often the, the saying that people use. And I often like to think of the producer as sometimes like the mayor of that village or someone that sort of tries to uh, shape and guide the village on their journey. Uh, a bit like a captain, I'd say. Oh, that's, they've, they've both given really great answers. <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna look great. Um, I always think of myself as a producer in terms of, well, I think that your brain has to be in two places at once. Um, so you kind of have to be in the control room overseeing everything and being aware that all of these a million things are going on and also be ready to jump in and, and get involved on the ground. Um, whether that's carrying set, because sometimes somebody has to, um, <laughs> or as I was doing the other day was I was soldering. I've, yeah, so there you go, all of the skills. Um, you don't have to learn how to solder. It's not, it's not, it's not a requirement. Um, but yeah, so I think it's all about, I mean, these two really said it, it is about making sure that everyone feels part of the team and really looking after people. At the end of the day, being a producer is always about the people, making sure the communication is happening. Mm. Yeah. Um, so I was going to ask about that, actually, like, how do you, for someone who wants to be a producer, how do you start to um, build that network and also learn to manage people in that way? Um, because obviously there are a lot of different voices. How do you manage that in a diplomatic way in theatre, especially? 
That's a, that's a great question. Um, I'm not entirely sure. I think you sort of just comes kind of naturally. have to start doing it. It's not that it comes naturally. You definitely mess it up. Um, but I think, yeah, it's, it's all about kindness, really, is if you put kindness at the center of everything, but without being gullible or being able to be pushed over, I think it's a really easy way to start. If you're always honest with people about where you are and what everyone needs to be doing, um, it, it's the best way. And also just keeping open communication and making sure people trust you. The problems always come when somebody doesn't want to say something because they feel embarrassed. And so setting up that space is really, it's difficult. There's no like really easy way of doing it. Um, mm. But it is really about openness and honesty, I think. Mm. And I think I'd, like, I'd, I'd add to that, that that journey never like, never ends. I, like I'm constantly like, going through that process and checking myself as a leader and checking my work, my communication practices and um, realigning kind of, you know, what I believe in and how I want to approach other people. And I think it's just like really important for me to kind of constantly have that revision of like, how am I talking to my team? How am mm. I approaching this? What's the holistic sort of vision for how I want to be as a producer and how I want to lead a team? Um, and that has changed many times over the last 10 years. <laughs> I think for me, it's about a constant curiosity. I think what Amina was saying about soldering is that often um, as producers, you end up being the glue that sort of binds everything together. And it often means that I often feel like I'm a jack of all trades, master of none, in that like there's so many skills that I'm constantly pulling on or learning from. And some of those are skills that I've developed through my training. So like in my instance, I started in the arts as a dancer. So I trained as a dancer. Not quite the debut on the Limbry stage, I expected. <laughs> um, but for me, all of that uh, craft that I learned through as a dancer, I pulled through into my producing. And then it's around all those other skills, those people management skills, those diplomacy skills, the crisis management, the risk, like all of those other things that I think you gradually start to pick up. And I think that what Amina's saying is really true around there's an element of kindness in there. And ultimately, I think as a producer, there's an element of humanism in there. For me, it's around uh, taking a step back and looking at the bigger picture and seeing what's needed to keep, keep it moving. And sometimes that's something really practical. Sometimes it's a conversation. Sometimes it's a bigger gesture. Um, but curiosity, I think, is something that I constantly keep within my practice of, oh, what if I go off and just look at that and then I get lost down a rabbit hole? But often it becomes really useful. Yeah, from a per career perspective, just because you mentioned your dancing, where did that shift come from and what kind of skills would you say made you think that being a producer was more for you? Yeah, I think for me I did, so I did a degree, a degree in contemporary and ballet dance and um, really interesting and absolutely was what I thought I wanted to do 10 years ago. And then I think as I got older I started to realise that um, I would have a, more autonomy as a producer. I think for me something that's really important about the job that I do is that it gives me the ability to be in control not in um, sort of a control freak way, but uh, I think as a producer, you often, you know, we all do different jobs. Um, we've all got independent practices as well as venue roles mm. or organizations that we work with. And it's that, as a producer, that ability to inject yourself into different scenarios to enhance or to develop or to move along something. And I think that that, for me, is one of the main reasons I wanted to go in, uh, into producing because it allowed me to really be quite greedy, actually. Like, I work across dance, theatre, live art, outdoor arts, and I wouldn't be able to necessarily do that if I stuck to just yeah. being a dancer, for example. Yeah, def definitely. I remember when I first kind of myself got into this, I was at university and I, I did a film degree and, and sort of was going to be a film producer. But it wasn't very cool to be a producer um, at <laughs> university. Um, there was only like maybe two or three of us that actually wanted to do it. The rest of everyone else in the cohort uh, in, my, in my uni classes, you know, were studying cinematography or directing or something like that. And everyone was like, why on earth do you want to do this? And I was like, there's no other role. And this, is, this does translate absolutely for theatre. There's no other role that genuinely like is there at the very gestational period and takes it through right to the very end. There is nobody else in a project like a producer who cares and nurtures that from beginning to end in quite the same way. Um, I mean, you know, a director comes close, but even then, you know, the, 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 that remit sort of stops at a certain point and that, that's sort of around marketing and, and sort of a legal obligation. But the producer is over all of that. And for me, that was so unique and so exciting and so special to really be a part of that, that 
the formation and the, the whole journey of a project instead of just sort of one element of it. Hmm. Absolutely, thank you. Something that you've all mentioned there is sort of the humanity, they're going through it from every single stage and how many hats you have to wear to be a producer. So something that we'd like to ask is, what are some of the most difficult decisions you have to make? When does it get really tough and how do you handle that? Who wants to start? I can start. Do you want to start? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll give you guys a second. Uh, for me, hands down, it's the marriment of financial risk and, artist and, and the artistic payoff of that. Um, that is, I, I have to check myself all the time and you do have to really look at the money and actually you would, you would think that what's about to come out of my mouth is kind of like, you know, um, not spending money, but it's the polar opposite. Mm. It's, like, it's like actually taking a look at something and going, this is worth investing in. I believe in this vision and I'm going to take the risk to go there. And that might mean like actually going a bit over budget or reallocating resources in a certain way, um, but really staying true to the overall vision and being like then realistic about what investment financial investment is needed in order to complete that vision and sort of staying true to that risk and unwavering um, in that decision to take that risk. That for me is the hardest challenge that I go on all the time. Yeah, I think, I think risk is a massive one. And I think that um, good producers, good organizations, good venues aren't afraid of taking risk. And um, really the true testament is how they deal with that risk and how they, uh, how they cope if the risk doesn't pay off. I think for me, the events of the last um, year, two years, gosh, um, have really shone into light sort of well-being and pastoral care and particularly being a producer in a venue um, albeit a small venue we've got a small core staff team but we're we wouldn't be able to do what we do without all of the freelancers that support us and making sure that all of those people got through the pandemic was a priority at New Diorama but for me it's the holding space for those difficult conversations for those slightly challenging like knotty questions that we that we talk about in the arts whether or not that's the work or it's about the dynamic or it's about the people in the room because you know producing theatre creating theatre is it's stressful and it's difficult and uh, as a producer you often have to end up holding that space for people and it means that uh, more often than not my role often becomes well-being focused checking in making sure people are okay has everyone got what they need to do their job because a big part of producing is enabling other people to do their job and to give them the tools that they need to do their job at their best. Um, and I think that it often means that you end up in some difficult scenarios and some really tricky conversations that you have to navigate. And you know, I'm, I'm not trained in any sort of pastoral counseling, well-being. Um, but again, like I said, that curiosity of picking that up as part of my practice and making sure that with everyone I work with that they have the attention and the care needed, because otherwise, sort of, theatre is powered by people, and without people that are healthy and happy, we're in a very different, a very different industry. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I would also add on to that that the difficulty often is making sure you look after yourself. Yes. Because <laughs> um, what, we, like, that whole conversation was just about we have to look after other people yeah. and make sure that we are completely passionate about taking a risk on the project, and sometimes we have to go. Actually, also, I need to look after myself and figure out if that risk beyond the financial as well is worth it. Because yeah. there's, there's a lot that you take a risk on there's a, you know, in, in your career. And, and it's really important to make sure that all of that is being, is being paid attention to. And you are looking after yourself. But I do think it often is about, it's about difficult conversations. Um, whether those be because of the financial or because of the pastoral, it's always about the difficult conversations. Because at the end of the day, like, you manage the money and you manage your, like, you know, when it comes to a, working with a computer or an Excel spreadsheet, that bit is fine. Um, but people are where we all do this job because we're passionate about it. Everyone in the arts does it because they're passionate about it. And it is difficult to, <laughs> to kind of say no or to look up, you know, turn around to someone and try and look after them because something has happened or because nothing has happened. And that's really difficult. Mm. But it, yeah, it's, it's always about conversations. <laughs> It just comes down to communication, it always does. <laughs> <laughs> so in terms of, we've spoken a lot about finances there. Uh, I think something that a lot of people looking at producing as a career would want to know is about finance specifically. And Emmy, you were asking earlier about Yeah, this. I was going to say, because there's not much transparency about it in the industry. Um, 
And like, there's a lot of conversations like, when do producers get paid? Like, when does it actually come back to you? How can you guarantee that? Like, um, I've, like a lot of people, the main thing people say, like, never use your own money, that kind of stuff. But like, what's your perspective on that? And what would you want to tell someone who's going into producing if there's like a warning or like something you should be aware of financially, this is a risk, that kind of thing? Yeah. yeah. Um, um. I mean, we all, we all work in quite different situations yeah. in that respect. Um, I, work, I work mainly in, in commercial theatre, um, which means that I work mainly with investment. And I do not come from money. I think that's very important to say. I don't, I don't know rich people. I don't have a rich uncle. I, like, I've been to so many of these things where somebody has said that, and they're like, I just called my uncle. I don't have that. Um, and I've definitely had some difficult times trying to raise investment, but it is... And it is, it's difficult, like the, the money side of things is difficult, particularly when you're trying to do it that way. Um, I truly believe that you should never use your own money. I think if you can't raise money for a project, you shouldn't be doing the project, is the world telling you something, um, or you shouldn't be doing the project at that moment. Um, particularly looking at, like, looking at budgets, whether it's kind of, you know, five grand or it's 150 grand or it's half a million, like no matter what the number is, if you can't, if you can't raise the money, Either you need more producing partners so that they can help you raise the money, or you, you shouldn't, really shouldn't be doing the project. Um, the best advice I got given at the beginning of my career was make your mistakes on someone else's money. So I got hired by other people at the beginning of my career. Um, but yes, it's, it's, all, it's difficult, um, but I would, never, I would never advise people putting their own money into things um, because it's never certain. I mean, if the last year, year and two years has shown us anything, it's never certain you can put money into a project and then a pandemic can happen. <laughs> um, so I, I just wouldn't do that at all. And the other, the other thing I would say is, this is a bit like nitty gritty, but I would just, my dad gave me this advice and I would set up yourself as a, as a limited company or as some separate entity um, if you are gonna be managing money because it should not be sat in your bank account if you're managing money for someone. Um, and it also means that if, the, if there is a pandemic, if something happens and that project doesn't happen and you owe people money and the company has to go bankrupt, you don't also go bankrupt. And that's a very nice thing <laughs> to not have to deal with. Yeah, um, I suppose to add to that in the, the sort of commercial space, um, we, we pay ourselves out of the project budgets like that is how ultimately we make money um, on, on like an independent or project by project basis. Um, it, it's the only way, the, um, sort of within that, there might also be royalties or other sort of bits and bobs. I was talking, you sort of alluded towards general management earlier. Maybe you've got a producer fee and a general management fee. The general management fee being something that, like for the work that you're putting in ongoing on a weekly basis. Um, so these are sort of the ways, but we do make money predominantly on a project by project basis via fees and uh, royalties. Um, I think everybody sort of assumes um, that really we're making money on the profit. And um, I can tell you, it is not like the Mel Brooks musical. The profit <laughs> comes around um, few and far between and we earn our income from fees. So the advice I sort of give then to a lot of people when they're creating their, their first shows, um, especially Vault Festival, we work with a lot of artists who are putting their, their work on stage for you know early on in their career in the first and second time and are often working with really reduced and tight budgets is don't, constantly sacrifice yourself sometimes you do have to build like you know you need to look at what your sustainable career here is and as a producer that means you have to pay yourself and you have to value yourself and not cut yourself out of the budget at the you know at the first inkling just because you you know you then want to kind of have an extra cast member or something like that um and that i think is the mm. first big financial mistake most independent producers do it, because it's unsustainable um eventually if you if you can't work out how to pay yourself out fees um from an organizational perspective uh, which is very different is you know we as, as amina said we we you work for other people, you get paid a salary. There, it's a job, it's a career, just like any other job or career. Um, you apply for the job and you, you, you clock into work that day and you get paid on PAYE. And so that's kind of the other really obvious thing. Um, I mean, I think the sort of broader finances of how a festival makes money or a, a theatre makes money is kind of another layer on that. But um, I do also get paid a salary. <laughs> that's where I come in. Yeah, so um, I, I mostly work within the subsidised sector, which means that a lot of the projects or things that I do um, 
come from funders, trusts and foundations, those sort of places. So I think primarily for me, um, when thinking about money, I often think about storytelling. And I think that, um, you know, for example, I'm from a working class background. Um, I'm really proud of that. And I think that more working class people should get into producing. Um, and I say that because what I what that gives me is, and this is obviously not true of everyone, but I'm quite a chatty person. And um, as my mum would say, I've got the gift of the gab. And actually, when you start to harness your ability to tell stories and spin narratives and to be able to really clearly communicate, in my instance, you know, we're, we want to do a project at New Diorama. What are the goals? What are the outcomes? How are we going to reach the target audience? Um, what other people might be interested in it? Like, all of that thing is about crafting the story that you want to tell and that means that you know using those skills to fundraise is often quite important and that applies to commercial avenues in that you know you go to your investors and you do a similar thing but particularly with people like Arts Council England or Trust and Foundations such as um, Esme Fairburn or Paul Hamlin or loads of other places um, the first thing you've got to be really clear on is what's the story that I'm telling what is the benefit of this project and that's very particular to subsidised theatre and particularly to somewhere like New Diorama, we're a charity. Um, it means that everything that we do has to have a benefit to the public and it means that we've got to report that uh, annually to the Charities Commission. Um, so it means that we constantly have to be aware of the story that we're telling. Um, I think the other thing that I would say is that um, don't, be, don't be afraid of fundraising applications. Um, there are plenty of people out there who are willing to sit down with you I being one of them, that's going to open up a plethora <laughs> of messages in my DMs. Um, but there are, there are lots of producers out there that will be happy to sit with you and have a coffee and take you through something like an Arts Council application. They can seem really daunting, but once you start to understand what's really behind the big words, um, it becomes much clearer. And I think that, again, in, in terms of what Amina's saying about don't take risk on um, your own money, do it on other people's money, um, there are going to be times where you are subsidising your own career. Um, because you as a producer will always end up, and I'm specifically talking about being an independent producer here, you will always end up working more hours than you are probably paying yourself for. But remember that that's because you're passionate and that's because that to get something over the line often you have to do that. And that is, I really struggled with that in the early part of my career. I really struggled mm. with the idea that I was essentially funding my own work. But once I pushed past that point, um, it was, it, you know, it was really beneficial. Um, yeah. Just to say as well, we're, so, we're one of the only countries in the world that has a thriving commercial yeah. and thriving subsidised yeah. sector. Um, most co other countries in the world rely on one or the other, mm. and ours are really equally, I mean, not quite equally, but like pretty much equally weighted, um, and that is a really unique to the United Kingdom. So mm. that is also a really, really special thing that we as producers can make and, and work in the commercial world as well as take advantage of the subsidised world and um, get money from grants, foundations, um, amazing organisations like Stage One. There is sort of subsidised and, and grant help out there that we can access um, to launch our career as well as making profit on the bums on seats. Amazing, that's all so helpful. That's exactly what we want to hear. <laughs> um, I was going to ask, have you ever felt imposter syndrome in this role or that you weren't going to make it? And like, how do you overcome it? This is also for people who are starting out. Like, how can they basically believe that they can get to where you are? Um, all the time, every day. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, the, so um, I'm 21. And I've been doing this for four years, and I'm very young for, for what I do. Um, and it is very easy to continually be surrounded by people who are older than me, and I think much wiser than me. Um, and, and to go, ha, who, who left the door open and how did I get in here? What happened? Um, but it's, it, yeah, all the time. It's really like, it, I don't think that goes away. Um, does it? I don't know. But no? OK, cool. Um, and so. I think the main thing about it is surrounding yourself with people who will turn around to you when you say, oh, I don't feel like I belong here, I don't feel like I deserve to be here, and will go, stop being silly. Yeah, you do. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, it's very important to have confidence in yourself as a producer, but it's also very human to not have confidence in yourself sometimes. Mm. Um, and particularly with this job, there's no, you'll never have all of the answers um, you'll, you'll never know everything, and that 
can't come into terms with that is difficult. Yeah. Um, but there's no way of, there's no full course that's going to teach you absolutely everything about producing that you need to know. So you will always think, oh, I don't know this and therefore I shouldn't be here. But mm. I can tell you now, it's not true. If you're, you're watching this, if you're sat here in the room, if you're online and you want to be a producer, then you're the right person and you deserve to be. Um, and it, yeah, and if you ever need somebody to say you should be a producer and, and this is what you're doing the right thing, I will, I will do it. Tweet me if you're feeling down. I will tweet you back and I will be like, you're, you're meant to be. Um, but yeah, I think it comes a lot with being young. It comes a lot with, and I don't think that you ever stop feeling young, by the way. I think from every conversation I've had, everyone feels too young for what they do. Um, but it, yeah, it comes from so many different things. And I know, I know that you know, for, for me, it comes from being young. It comes from being a woman. It comes from being a woman of color um, and not feeling like I see a lot of people like me in these spaces. But I promise you, one, that there will be more people like you if you can't see yourself right now. Um, and two, that you will be that person for someone else. Mm. Um, and so even if you think kind of, Oh, I don't, I don't, I don't know why I'm here. I don't belong to be here. I promise you, you're inspiring someone in everything that you do. Yeah, yeah. I think I, I'm, I'm a bit older than you, um, but the imposter syndrome never goes away. I think that, and what I said earlier about the reason that I went into this career is, and and Sophie said it as well, around advocacy. And I think that the difficult thing is that producers often do feel imposter syndrome. Everyone feels it. But I think producers feel it more because more often than not, you're the person that has to embrace that and accept that first because the whole role of being a producer is enabling others. You know, in the job that I do, I, I'm in a venue that means that I've got a certain responsibility in terms of the people that we hire, in terms of the, that's right down from the front of house staff right up to, you know, technicians, freelancers, whoever. And it means that if I can put myself in that position and embrace that, I'm going to bring other people with me. And I think that just to touch on something that Amin is saying around the biggest thing I hold um, in what I do is the fact that I always look over my shoulder. And I think that more often than not, what happens in this sector is that um, we have leaders that um, you know, have a, a brilliant rise to fame and, and get to the top position, artistic director, executive director, whatever. And then while they're stood on their podium, they turn around and they look behind them and uh, see who's following them. And more often than not, I think um, that's too late because those people are too far away from you. So I'm five years into my career and it means that what I often end up doing is I find younger producers who are one, two, three years into their career and I mentor them or I work with them and I support them because it was only two years ago for me. So I'm probably in a better place than going to an artistic director and asking them for advice because what I can do is I can give you a practical reflection of the journey that you're going on, but also hopefully can connect you to other people that can be useful for you. And I think that in terms of dealing with imposter syndrome, the biggest advice I can probably give is surround yourself with other producers, other artists, other makers. Um, there are loads of brilliant courses out there like Stage One, like the China Place Optimists, Roundhouse Young Producers, lots of different things that you can um, uh, go to and meet a network of other like-minded people and uh, you know I'm probably in about 10 whatsapp chats with other producers but they're the best place to go to when I'm feeling down or I've had a difficult conversation or I've got an artist who needs advice and I don't quite know how to approach that conversation I go to one of my peers and more often than not it really helps me and I just remember all of those reasons why I'm doing what I'm doing yeah, I feel like I need to take both of your advice, like <laughs> with my own, own imposter syndrome, because yeah, yeah, um, I, you know, just to add to that, like what Reese was saying as well, just kind of off, off, fearing off a little bit from imposter syndrome. It can be really lonely yeah. um, being a producer, and I think that's really what feeds a lot of this, is that you know there is a huge element of faking it till you're making it, and I don't think that goes away at any point. And that's what's feeding the imposter syndrome. And you, you're expected a lot of the time to have the answers to everything, and how, how is that possible? Um, nobody has the answers to everything. And so you do need a, and you don't have many other people necessarily that you can be emotionally vulnerable with or, or or whatever, and that creates that loneliness and feeds into that imposter syndrome. So I do think it's really important to have uh, a network and a, you know, of, of other producers who you can lean on and you can kind of talk to and be like, am I crazy? Does this make sense? 
you know, should I just give up now? And they sometimes might need to give you a reality check and be like, that is a mo mental idea or, or, or help nurture and get through that imposter syndrome. Um, or it could be other creatives and finding your tribe, I think, in a weird way, like, and, and nurturing and finding your team of people that you want to constantly, like, work with and are passionate about, I think, is, like, the, the first point of a journey really of building that up and, and feeling supported and feeling like there's people that you can kind of go and have a chat to and, and work through the loneliness and the imposter syndrome. Um, yeah. That's so helpful. Thank you so much. So we're going to open up to the floor. If anyone has any questions, there's a question over there. We just shout it loud. The question was, how do you help others get to where they want to be, as well as making sure that you're also getting to where, reaching the goals that you want to get to? Um, I'll start on this one because I feel like I yabbed a lot about enabling people. Um, but like a big part of my practice is artist development. So I, I, I trained as a dancer. I did, I did the artistic training. And I use a lot of that in the way that I approach working with artists. And I think that, you know, fundamentally, uh, it's about bringing people with you, as I said, but for me, it's around those conversations where I sit down with an artist and I go, OK, let's just interrogate this idea that you've got like, for this project. Um, through those conversations, I develop myself because it's that push and pull of um, being able to work off each other. And you know, some of the best relationships I have are with artists that I've been on you know, a two, three year journey with and we've worked on several projects together or we've, we've tried to work on projects and it's failed, but through that we've sort of supported each other. And I think that there's a codependency there in that artists often need producers. Uh, artists definitely sometimes do need producers, but producers need artists. Um, like I'm always looking for interesting people because um, I, oft, I want to constantly diversify my practice and work with new people. And I often find myself going, oh, this feels really similar to something else that I've done. And some might see that as a good thing, in that you, you build up a sort of a regular portfolio or a way of working. But in my instance, I often go, OK, well, what if I do something different this time? Because producing, for me, is all about that transferable, uh, those transferable skills that you can use and take across projects. So a big thing for me is that you know, people say, oh, I started off as a dance producer, so I produced dance productions, because that was a natural progression. And often people would go, oh, like, but you're now working in theatre. How did that happen? And I was like, look, guys, like producing in dance is very similar to producing in theater. It's just that sometimes you put a bit more money in the physiotherapy line. Um, and genuinely, it often boils down to being as simple as that. And, and for me, it's that constantly being curious again and meeting people because as they develop, I develop and we develop together, if that makes sense. Yeah, for sure. Um, that, that's definitely how I started out. And I still have many, many people I work with on a regular basis who have kind of been champions of me and I've been champions of them and, and that that's that's kind of like that finding your team and finding your people and, and really building that up. Um, I also think it's about creating a shared vision. That's for me like the most important thing in terms of balancing that like what's your ambition with the thing uh, with, with like the the pastoral care element and working with people actually if you're all on the same page and mm. you're really um, constantly communicating what is it we're working towards and why then a lot of that conflict goes away all the time. Like you, you kind of bring it back to the big picture, bring it back to why you're here. And do you know what? A lot of the little niggly stuff about who's going to make a decision about like, I don't know, the poster design or whatever, like those conflicts can like kind of mellow out if you've got the big picture. Yeah. Yeah. Um, to kind of add on that in terms of career ambition and like a wider pr practice, um, I think I, I, maybe this is going to make me sound terrible. Um, let's hope not. Um, but I have quite a clear idea of where I want to be as a, as a producer, and I try and plan projects along that line um, realistically with things that work both for me and for the artist. So it is sometimes going to be a case of going, hey, do you know what? Where we're at doesn't align quite, quite now. Um, because, because my practice as a producer also comes into 
slightly different. It's not all about artist development as Reese's practices. It's, it's about some other things as well. <laughs> I'm trying to really not make myself sound terrible. Um, I, I, like, I, I know that I want to work on Broadway and I know that I like doing West End work. And so like, it's about knowing that sometimes that I develop a show right at the beginning of its, of its kind of creation, as, as Sophie said earlier. Um, and then I know that it's going to go somewhere and I, I can see the path for it. And sometimes it's a realistic thing about going, this is the scale that this show works on and it fits really well for where my career is at, for where this artist's career is at, for where the director's career is at. And all of us are in line for this project and might not be for the next one. Um, and that's absolutely fine. Some of the best relationships I have are with artists that we work together on one project and then our careers kind of stepped on from there and went in different directions and that's absolutely fine. So sometimes it is about kind of saying no to things that don't feel like they serve either you or the artist. Um, because if you say yes and it doesn't, and you don't feel like it's advancing your career, you're kind of going to re resent it slightly. Yeah, we've actually got some questions online. We do. Um, so we've had quite a lot around this kind of area, but do you think it's more beneficial to get an education or qualification in producing um, or to get experience? And if it is experience, because I have a feeling that you're probably going to go along those lines, how do you get that experience? <laughs> Anyone have, do, do you have a qualification in producing? Uh, I, no, I went to film school, um, but no, that's not a qualification in theatre producing. <laughs> and then, that, that is not no, that. And I don't, I don't, none, so none of us have a qualification in theatre producing. <laughs> Um, so that, to start there, I, I, I don't know what that says, um, <laughs> but I think, I mean, I've done some short courses, I've done some education stuff with Stage One, um, I did something with the National Theatre as well, and I did a bit of time at RADA. Um, I did a bit of time at RADA, that sounds like a prison. It's not, it's very lovely. <laughs> I do a brilliant youth company course. Um, and, but otherwise, I've not had any formal training in producing. There are some MAs that I know of. Um, and I think a lot of it is about figuring it out as you go along. Um, there are some basic skills that you can kind of pick up from short courses and from, from kind of workshops and things, but I, it is really, you kind of have to do it um, because it is, yeah, you do, you do pick it up as you go. Um, and as I said, none of us have official qualifications in producing. Um, so clearly, you can do it with just experience. I think I, I was really lucky in that I I graduated from my dance course on the Friday and I went straight into a, a venue role on the Monday and that was because of, um, I was in the, genuinely it was in the right, I was in the right place at the right time, but also as I like to remind everyone that also it's, it's not just about luck, it's about uh, talent and determination and all of those other things. Um, but what I think uh, is that there aren't enough of those jobs um, and we know that and we know that there are, there are not enough assistant producer jobs or junior producer roles that people can really get their teeth stuck into so what I'm really interested in doing is finding ways of bringing um, younger producers into projects whether or not that's as an associate or as an assistant and even if that's for like a five-day period because um, producing is a deeply practical job as, as Amina is sort of alluding to and I think that on the job learning is often really beneficial. What I will say is that I think MAs or educational courses or even some of these other things that we've spoken about like China Play or Stage One or, or these other places that offer um, producing courses, whether or not that's formalised or, or informal, is that they're really great opportunities to press pause on your practice and evaluate and to reassess and to actually like um, build up your toolbox. Um, I often talk about uh, producing being like a toolbox and pulling out different things. Um, so they're really useful as a moment to sort of go, actually, I've done a year of sort of freelance in and out of different things. I took something to Vault. I did this, I did that. And actually, like, I now just want to collate all of that together and reflect on what I do know and what I don't know. And I can tell you now that like, you, you'll do that throughout your entire career. I do that most weeks. I just sort of sit down at the end of a busy week and go, is this the right thing for me to be doing? Am I still learning? Am I still growing? And you know, when the time comes that I stop doing that, I'll find something new. Um, so I think that, yeah, there aren't enough opportunities. I really hope there are going to be more opportunities. And I know through my independent practice, that's something that I'm really looking at, is that every project I do, I'm trying to make sure that I can have uh, an associate or an assistant on it, so that they have the ability to sort of like learn on the job. Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, I suppose I, I wanted to just, like talk about my route in because it was so not like becoming an assistant producer. It took me probably around three, four years um, before I landed my first 
um, sort of paid, proper paid job as the general manager at Iris Theatre. Um, and it was because I'd come from this like other world, right? I, I, you know, I was Australian for one. I got on a plane at 21 years old and I moved to the other side of the world. I, you know, I went to film school, which isn't a far cry from theatre, admittedly. But ultimately, I didn't have any, I, I didn't have any network here. I didn't know anybody in this country. And I didn't really understand what, the, the industry was or the process of making theatre. And I identified that gap. And so the first thing I did was I spent 12 months as a stage manager because I was like, I need to learn what the act of actually putting a piece of work on stage is if I'm going to get into this world. And st for me, stage managers are the, you know, was the ultimate role to understand how a rehearsal room works, how to run a tech, how to communicate with lighting designers, sound designers, actors, um, how to see a show through from beginning to end, how to understand the nuances of what goes on in a live stage and how to troubleshoot problems from that perspective. I did 12 months of that and simultaneously um, spent about four years working um, as well as like developing my producing practice and kind of um, assisting people and like volunteering and like hanging out like a bad smell at other at theatres probably like Reese's <laughs> being like please 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 can I just like shadow you can I just hang out like I need to learn. I was earning my money through box office in front of house and, and sort of was doing a lot of box office management front of house management and now really those skills that I like developed um, from doing not being a ass paid assistant producer at the start not being a paid production assistant but like going back to the fundamentals and developing the skills in other areas I'm so grateful to have now as a producer um, because it means that I have that that toolbox it, mm. it taught me that toolbox and it taught me how to empathize with every single member of my team on theater side or, or on my production team Hi. Um, I was just going to ask, what, could you describe the difference between like, being an independent producer and like, producing for you know, like a theatre or an organisation? And how did you guys go about like, setting up your own like, private team? Because I, have, I just feel like you need to have like, a bank of money to even start producing shows. And I feel like that's not going to be easy to come by. So how did you get into that as well? Um, the question was, um, what is the difference between being an independent producer and producing for a venue or an organisation and how did you get into that? Thank you. I, I, should, I should take this one, shouldn't I? Um, yeah, so I, I think that when we say independent producer, being a producer is, is really like who's putting on the show, who is presenting the show quite often. So when I talk about being an independent producer, that's because um, that's external to any other work that I do with venues or other organisations. And it's about me as a producer with my producing partner, Emily Beecher. Um, she'd kill me if I didn't say her name. Um, <laughs> but uh, we're sort of supporting and resourcing that. I think in terms of your question around um, how do you set it up? Do you need money? No, it costs like 35 quid to set up a limited company. Um, and how we started, we only started uh, working in a company structure a year ago. And, and really all it was is that we sort of pooled together the projects that we were working on. Um, and then also just started to submit some ACE bids, uh, Arts Council England bids. And as they started to come in, and that wasn't an easy process. I'm not saying like within two months we had thousands of pounds. Like they take time and energy. And what we then did is pulled those together and built something and started working on that project over there, which meant that whilst we were doing that, we could build that project over there. And very slowly you start to jigsaw puzzle piece it together. Um, so I think in terms of, and then in terms of sort of like, being a producer in an organisation, um, what feels starkly different in my role as a producer in an organisation is that often the projects come to me already formed and then I take over and I sort of like uh, push them along. Whereas as an independent producer, as Sophie said earlier, you sort of, you're really there at the beginning and you're sort of one of the initiators of the ideas. And I think that's why lots of producers probably dabble in both because it's really exciting to develop your own work but also like I learned so much through working in an organ organization um, right through to, to really basic things like just how a building works and like one bit of my job which I always talk about is I'm the person responsible for stocking up toilet roll like that's how sort of like basic producing in a venue often can become is that it's really hands-on and it's that like running a business that I think is the the bit that I enjoy working in an organization for yeah um 
I, I mean, I think Reese and I are testament to kind of this question really is that we both do both, yeah. right? And so many people do because you kind of have to. And like as much as, because I couldn't, you know, I couldn't sustain an income um, from being a full-time independent producer, although Amina can tell us some secrets about how to do that in a second, hopefully. Um, but you hustle as well, right? We all hustle. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, even if you're freelance, you, ha you, you know, you, you subsidize it by working the Saturday job on the box office um, mm. or front of house in the evenings or whatever. I mean, he's going to tell us in a bit. And I know you've done, no, I'm saying this in a good way because you've done so much um, amazing freelance sort of projects, but yeah. with like with the venues and stuff like mm. that as well in a different way to Reese and I who were like employees. Yeah. Um, but you know, let's be blunt, that, that relationship, it benefits the organizations that yeah. Reese and I work for. Yes. They benefit from the fact that we are going outside and networking and creating contacts with other people outside of our organizational bubble. And we, of course, benefit greatly mm. from being um, employees um, of, of an organization and being on the theater side because we develop all so many skills in a safe way. We're spending other people's money. Um, <laughs> as Amina sort of alluded to, we're learning, we're making our own things. So that's kind of what I would say as well. Just yeah. to expand on that, sorry, is that, I, and this sounds really like, oh, but I, I think that what Sophie's really saying is that it's around you as a producer or a brand and that sounds really like Ugh, but like uh, the brand for me is about values it's about what do I bring and it's about knowing that you can jump between organizations and your independent projects and there's a continuity there because I'm a person I'm a, I'm a human I've got things I care about and I've got values that I take across everything and that's that's where the value is is that you bring you take that to an organization but you can also take that to independent artists and that's just something you keep building Sorry. Yeah. I mean, if we could actually just have one last piece of wisdom, because we do have to wrap up. Okay. Oh, gosh, that's Kill so scary. <laughs> no um, pressure. One, you don't only have to work for organisations. You can also work for other producers. A lot of what, I, like, the way that I make yeah. money sometimes is by working as a general manager for other people. I general managed a magic show called Wonderville in the West End most recently, um, and I got paid a weekly fee for that, so that was how I made money. I do also currently, to, sorry to pop the bubble, but I do currently work for Soho Theatre for, for the next year as an in-house producer. Um, for the half of my time, so also that. But you, you can definitely work across different things. Thank you so much, and thank you everyone for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. That was brilliant.